My name is Clive Bates. Uh, I'm Director of Counterfactual Consulting uh, and I'm former Director of Action on Smoking and Health uh, in the UK. Um, I want to talk today about the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and I have five main observations that I want to make. Uh, the first is that basically I think the WHO FCTC is a good idea. I was involved at the early stages, I think starting in 1999, um, and was one of those that helped put together the uh, alliance of non-governmental organisations that was set up to support the FCTC, now known as the Framework Convention Alliance. And the idea was that we were attracted to at the time, pretty simple, um, there's about a billion smokers in the world, there's about uh, at the time, people were saying that on current trends, a billion people would die from smoking-related disease. The question then was, well, what can we do about it? Um, and the idea was to take all that was well understood and well known on tobacco policy in uh, Europe, in Australia, in Canada, United States, um, best practice in, you know, I don't know, France, wherever, and say, well, how do we generalise that so that um, every country in the world, particularly developing countries where there may not have been that much familiarity with this, but it was a growing problem, what, what is it that we could do to help them all work together? And the idea is that everybody would be involved together. It would be um, you know, a common set of policies, common set of ideas based on what we know works. Everyone would be doing it and therefore it'd be harder for the tobacco companies to pick off individual um, companies. So things like bans on advertising, uh, warnings and so on, you know, these were all things that we thought ought to be done by every country in the world. And the idea is that the FCTC would help us do that. That unfortunately is not how it has played out subsequently, which brings me to my second point, which I want to call the, the cult of Article 5.2. Now, buried in the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is an article, 5.2, which essentially says that governments should take steps uh, to protect their health and tobacco policies from the commercial and vested interests of the tobacco industry. Fair enough. It wasn't very controversial at the time, it wasn't even discussed very much. It was almost taken as if it was a statement of the obvious, and it's something you would you know, not, not think would be unusual in any convention if you were regulating, um, you know, the chemical industry uh, or, you know, energy industries or whatever. You would, you would try to ensure uh, that the policies that were produced were not, uh, if you like, influenced in the wrong way by the industries in, involved. Fair enough. <clears throat> the trouble is that it didn't stop there. Um, that was what was agreed in 2003 when the original treaty was put together. But by 2008, uh, guidance had come out on how to implement Article 5.3, which contained a set of principles. And the first principle was that there is a fundamental and irreconcilable uh, conflict between the interests of the tobacco industry and the interests of public health. Now, that is very different to what it says in Article 5.3. And it's very different in one important way is that it's actually wrong. Um, that is essentially, and it was clear at the time it was wrong, because we had examples, for example, the case of snus in Sweden, where we could see that certain tobacco products were the reason why we had very low levels of smoking and much lower levels of ill health as a result. So Sweden, back in 2003 and in 2008, was very clear, was a proof of concept for tobacco harm reduction, yet it was based on a product produced by, uh, a tobacco product, and a product produced by the tobacco industry, not necessarily marketed as a safer product, just was safer because it didn't involve combustion, and responsible for much less harm to health, and therefore something that we should take seriously. Now, Article 5.3 and its development has meant that that kind of philosophy has been marginalised amongst the parties and amongst the um, people who influence the FCTC. And in fact, it's gone a different way altogether, which brings me to my third point, which is that WHO and the parties to the FCTC and uh, many of the non-governmental organisations involved 
have taken on a prohibitionist approach. OK, and we have constantly seen WHO pushing prohibition, um, prohibition, not of cigarettes, strangely enough, the really dangerous product that causes all the ill health, but um, prohibition of the alternatives, prohibition of vaping, smokeless tobacco products, heated tobacco products, anything new and novel where they think they can get away with it. They have taken on a prohibitionist approach that I think has been terrible. And what it means is combined uh, with the emphasis on Article 5.3 is that they've made um, tobacco harm reduction like a pariah idea. They've made it appear as if it's a plot by the tobacco industry, whereas actually what it is is a characteristic of the nicotine market in which consumers and producers are switching to much lower risk products in their own interest for their own good. Prohibitions then are absurd. I mean, what a prohibition does is to, um, you know, basically provide a protection for the cigarette trade. It favours the black market and it works against sensible regulation of the, um, the products that you're trying to prohibit. It basically prevents you regulating e-cigarettes and, you know, smokeless tobacco products, nicotine pouches properly because you just ban them, it doesn't make them go away. What that means is they're just supplied by criminals, black marketeers who really don't care about regulation or don't have that much interest uh, in the welfare of the consumer. Um, so it's incredibly counterproductive. But above all, the worst thing about it is that it infringes a fundamental principle of public health, which is the autonomy, personal autonomy. You are basically saying to a smoker, you as a government or you as WHO, I am going to prevent you taking steps in your own interest, at your own expense, to reduce the risk to your health, OK, uh, by banning a product, a perfectly reasonable, you know, not, not completely safe, but very much safer product that you could use instead of smoking. What an incredible invasion of people's rights that actually really is. It's astounding when you think about it. Now, why has this happened? Uh, that brings me to my fourth point. Well, there's really two reasons. Um, firstly, is that a lot of the people involved in this field, including the people involved at WHO, have an instinctive prohibitionist reflex. They think in the banning something solves a problem. Uh, you know, if you just get rid of it, it's gone. And if we're on the way to getting rid of all tobacco products or all nicotine products, then if there's some we can pick off now, that's part of the job done. Um, you know, in other words, every prohibition is a step towards prohibiti prohibiting everything. And it's a completely ridiculous way of looking at it, because what you're really doing is prohibi prohibiting the safer options, not making progress towards uh, a tobacco-free goal, you're basically strengthening and entrenching the positions of the most dangerous products. But the second reason why they've done that, why it's headed this way, is, you know, the, the kind of uh, most addictive and nastiest drug of all, which is money. And the um, flow of money into the system from, um, you know, a, a couple of very, very well-funded sources. American uh, billionaires like Bloomberg have been putting millions and millions of dollars into this system, funding WHO, funding the World Bank, funding uh, networks of non-governmental organizations. Um, but they're doing it with their own preconceived ideas about what, what good public health looks like. And in Bloomberg's case, that includes prohibiting vaping products on the record said it to the New York Times during his ill-fated race to be president, uh, Democrat presidential uh, candidate, uh, that he thinks that vaping products should be prohibited. So he comes in with a giant vested interest himself, but laden with billions of dollars and an aggressive public health-based marketing campaign to try and get vaping um, you know, banned. And that, that, to me, is incredibly unhealthy, that all these people purporting to be in favour of public health, up to and including 
the WHO, but many, many uh, intermediary organizations are taking money from a prohibitionist. They don't even realize what a conflict of interest it is, but it's a giant conflict of interest and it's massively distorting the debate about the future of tobacco policy, nicotine policy. Um, an unmitigated disaster in my view, but he's completely unaccountable. Okay, and that brings me to my fifth and final point, is what should we do about this? Well, Bloomberg and the American billionaire, uh, you know, money have created a giant network of fake civil society, essentially front organizations for one man uh, who has some very strong ideas about what to do on tobacco policy, though he doesn't really have any experience in this field or in public health. He's a financial services um, billionaire, uh, but he has all the confidence that comes with being a financial services billionaire, even though he knows nothing about the subject he's funding. So the answer to a fake network of civil society organisations is a genuine network of civil society organisations. And by that, I mean uh, a complicated, complex network, I hope, uh, of uh, consumers, uh, producers, public health campaigners such as myself, um, people who work at the front line in the medical profession, people with experience of uh, helping people to quit smoking or, you know, respiratory physicians who treat people with lung illnesses, all working together to say, look, the, we've got to focus here on the opportunity. Yes, there are risks, but the risks are manageable. Moderate, proportionate regulation will deal with them. Uh, the opportunities are huge. If we really get this right, we could phase out, we could obsolete the most dangerous forms of nicotine use, the combustible tobacco products. We could do that in 10 to 15 years. And um, what we have to do is to get behind that idea, create a big alliance of people who are genuinely interested and knowledgeable about public health and start to make the case to governments. Not waste our time in the conference of the parties in WHO, but make the case in capitals uh, with the public health people in government who really need the results. They need to reduce smoking. They need to reduce the burdens on the healthcare system. They're directly responsible and accountable for public health outcomes. They're the people who listen and WHO will listen to them. It's going to be a fight, but it is winnable. It's, we're, we're taking a lot of you know, heat at the moment, but in the long run, this idea, the harm reduction idea will prevail because it's the right idea.